Greetings in Jesus' name. My name is Pastor Brian Len, and you are watching The Dream That Would Not Die. On today's episode, we'll be discussing a document entitled A Statement on the Historical Situation. This document was presented to the Special Conference of Lutheran Laymen and Pastors at Thief River Falls, Minnesota in 1962, which is considered to be the organization of the AFLC. This is when the AFLC began. And we see in this document the reasons that those folks made at that time that they did not want to be part of the merger of the Lutheran Free Church into the American Lutheran Church. That's what was going on at that time. There were lots of mergers within the Lutheran Church and within other Protestant denominations. And these folks that met in Thief River Falls in October of 1962 did not want to be part of a merger. They wanted to stay out. And because they were a minority, a very small minority in fact, of the Lutheran Free Church, they felt it was necessary to put down in writing the reasons they had for remaining out of the merger. Now, there was literature flying around at that time in newspaper articles and newsletters and pamphlets that had a very negative tone about this issue on both sides. And this document, by way of contrast, has a very peaceful tone. The author of the document took great care to be charitable and to give the benefit of the doubt to those with whom he disagreed. However, he stated the reasons very clearly very plainly. And we see here the five foundational principles that I mentioned in the welcome episode. The high view of scripture, an orthodox doctrine of Christ, the Lutheran understanding of justification, a desire for a life of Christian piety, and congregationalism. Those five things are all present in this document. Now the two that receive the least attention, understandably so, are justification and Christology. And the reason for that is historical. The American Lutheran Church didn't really have a different doctrine of justification. It didn't really have a different doctrine of Christ than these minority congregations that wanted to remain out of the merger. That wasn't really a question on the table. Those topics do come up in this document because there were concerns that things were moving in a wrong direction on even those points. But the three main issues that are brought up here in this document are congregationalism, piety, and the doctrine of scripture. The doctrine of scripture receives prime of place, and the first two points that are mentioned in this statement on the historical situation have to do primarily with the doctrine of scripture. There are five points, five headings, here in this document. And I'll just read you what the headings are, first of all. But I should mention, before I begin, where one can obtain a copy of this document. It can be found in this book, the, and it's entitled, Free and Living Congregations, The Dream That Would Not Die. Now obviously this is the inspiration for my, the name of my YouTube channel. I really like, I really love this book. I've read it two or three times. It can be obtained from Ambassador Publications. You can go on their online store and order it. Wonderful book. Highly recommended. I haven't been able to find a PDF of this document online, so if you want to read it, you'll have to get the book. And it's found on pages 268 to 280 in this book. Now the five the five points here that were given for why this minority group wanted to stay out of the merger were as follows. Item one, the membership of the American Lutheran Church in the World Council of Churches. Item two, theology. That's, that's the title, is theology. And we'll come back to what they're mentioning there. Item three, church polity. Item four, high churchliness. And item five, pietism. 
So, back to the beginning, we have, first of all, the membership of the American Lutheran Church in the World Council of Churches. Now, this was a very complex issue, and that is acknowledged here in this document, that there are arguments for and against, and the author of the document says, while we have brothers in Christ who are convinced that being part of the World Council of Churches is not a bad thing, but indeed a good thing, we're not convinced, and we want to stay out. Very respectful tone in this document. However, it is very clear that the doctrine of Scripture is the main reason that the World Council of Churches was viewed as an issue by this group of Lutherans. Here we have a quote in this document of the Statement of Faith of the World Council of Churches. I'll read to you what this Statement of Faith is for the World Council of Churches. They confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the Scriptures, and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the foundation for the World Council of Churches, that confession that I just read, and this document acknowledges that. However, I'm going to read another quote from this document on page 270. It has been pointed out by a number of Lutheran theologians that the phrase, according to the scriptures, does not mean to many in the World Council what it means to us, as expressed, for instance, in the United Testimony or the Augsburg Confession. Unquote. Now here, what he's pointing out is that while the expression according to the scriptures might be in their confession, there are people in this body who don't see the same things in the scriptures that we see when we look at the scriptures. And that's a problem. You see, even the earliest heretics said that they confessed the scriptures. Now, some of them changed the canon, and some of them twisted various scriptures to their own interpretations. But that's the issue at stake here, is a proper interpretation of scripture. I'll continue reading here because the author lists some things that others in the World Council of Churches confess that we don't see in the scriptures. Quote, As an example, there are those within the World Council who do not see in the Bible the virgin birth of Jesus the physical resurrection of Jesus, his real presence in the sacrament of the altar, or the bodily return of Christ to judge the quick and the dead. We do not see how we can, with these, make a united witness to the world for Christ." Unquote. Here is the one spot in this document that the doctrine of Christology comes up. Christology is important to us. And perhaps it is not as often challenged as some of our other tenets, because we share our Christology with a lot more global Christians than we share, for example, our Congregationalism. But this is an important issue. And it was an important issue for the founders of the AFLC back in 1962. They saw that there was a compromise on the doctrine of the Word, and they saw that that resulted in a compromise on the doctrine of Christ. And because of that compromise, which they saw, they were not willing to be part of the World Council of Churches and say, in effect, that we are of one mind with you. Because they weren't. They acknowledged that there were real differences, indeed fundamental differences, and they did not wish to be a part of the World Council. The doctrine of justification also gets a tip of the hat here because of the mentions made to the Augsburg Confession and to the real presence of Christ in the sacrament of the altar. Those are both acknowledgments of our Lutheran Confession and as I mentioned before because these folks in 1962 were breaking away from another Lutheran church body that shared basically the same doctrine of justification that wasn't the big issue on the table here. However, it is mentioned because it is important to us and was at that time as well. Another issue that comes up in connection with this World Council of Churches is the issue of church unity, 
which falls under the heading of Congregationalism in the foundational principles that I've mentioned before. Allow me to read another quote to you from page 270. The Lutheran Free Church congregations have generally been more lenient in fellowship with other church groups than perhaps any others of the Lutheran family. But these fellowships have existed where there has been a oneness of spirit in a local community and an opportunity for witness. It is quite another thing to give a more blanket recognition to denominations, some of whose ways and teachings we are not at all sure about, and some we really can't accept." Unquote. Here, the author of this document makes the claim, and I would happily go behind this claim, that church unity is something that happens primarily at the local level. It happens within local congregations, and it happens among local congregations that know one another and can examine one another's lives and confessions. When one attempts to have mergers between enormous denominations, or peace talks, as it were, between enormous denominations, it's very hard. Because you have local people within one enormous group over here, and local people within this enormous group over here that don't want to get along with one another one bit. Or, perhaps, you have local people, two local churches in a particular town, that would get along with one another just fine, if it weren't for the fact that their national or global headquarters told them that they weren't allowed to get along with one another. Unity, this document asserts, is something that can happen at the local level, and indeed happens much better at the local level than it happens when national offices or global offices try to have conversations with one another. So much for the World Council of Churches. On this issue, it is primarily the doctrine of scripture that is at stake. The founders of the AFLC did not want to compromise their doctrine of the scriptures or the doctrines that they saw in the scriptures in order to be part of the World Council of Churches. The next point here, point number two, is simply entitled Theology. The comment that is made here, and I'll read from page 273, says, We are conservative theologically. We are most of us reared in this tradition and wish to continue in it. We are living in a time when rapid changes in thought regarding the Word of God are taking place. Here we see again that what this is referring to, what is at stake, is the doctrine of Scripture. When the founders of the AFLC looked at the world around them, looked at the theological climate of their day, they saw departures from the doctrine of Scripture, and they did not wish to be a part of it. They wanted to let Scripture interpret Scripture, they wanted to see the scriptures interpreted according to the confessions of their church. And that isn't what they were seeing in all cases. A sub-point in this point number two about theology talks about the Roman Catholic Church. You might recall, if you're a church history buff, that the early 1960s was also the setting for Vatican II, a very important event in the history of the Catholic Church. And a lot of things came out of the Catholic Church that, during that time, that this document applauds. However, and this is another quote here from this document, we do not share the optimism of some in regard to the Roman Church. The main objections to Roman Catholicism which Martin Luther had 400 years ago, and which caused him to be excommunicated, are still present today. Namely, his belief that justification is by faith alone and that the Bible must be the supreme religious authority of man. If the Roman Catholic Church would accept Luther's position on these, then we would have an entirely different situation. Here, the two jewels are the scripture and justification. Here, this again is primarily a scripture issue, but also it is a justification issue. And this was present here in this document as one of the founding principles, one of the things that was very important to this group of people and continues to be important to us today in AFLC. 
we value our doctrine of justification, and we are not prepared to budge on that issue. We also believe that the scripture is the number one authority, and it stands in that position all by itself. It does not share its number one authority with anything else. The scripture alone is our guide for life and conduct. That does not mean there's nothing valuable to learn from other sources. However, the Bible is the supreme authority, and it has that supreme authority all by itself. And that's point number two. One was the World Council of Churches. Two was theology. Both of these are primarily about the doctrine of Scripture. Now, point number three is called church polity. And obviously, this is primarily about congregationalism. Here, the main issue at stake, the presenting issue, was the institution of district presidents in the American Lutheran Church. And the little point that's made here is that district presidents had to sign off on congregational letters of call. Now, for those perhaps unfamiliar with the process of obtaining a pastor, what was done in the Lutheran Free Church and what is done in the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations today is that it was the responsibility of a congregation to call a pastor. And if a congregation said, we want you to be our pastor, and that pastor accepted the call, those are the only two parties involved that needed to approve of that. Now, they might consult with the headquarters, and frequently they do. However, there's no official approval that needs to come from headquarters. It's more of a networking kind of business when headquarters is involved. In the American Lutheran Church, however, this Office of District President was given more than an advisory or networking position. He was given actual authority by requiring his signature on all letters of call. The founders of the AFLC did not think that it was quite the same thing to say on the one hand that congregations have a right to call their own pastor, or on the other hand that congregations have a right to call their own pastor, but all of the letters of call have to be signed by the district president. They were quite concerned that this institution of district presidents, primarily with this authority that they were granted, was a hindrance to congregational autonomy that they believed, and we still believe, is ours according to the word of God. The fourth issue here in this document is high churchliness. Now, this issue is actually less about worship style than it is about congregationalism. When this document talks about high churchliness, it doesn't slam high churchliness as being awful or inappropriate. However, it expressed concern over the attitude of the American Lutheran Church that high churchliness and unity on that subject was necessary. This article on page 275 itself quotes from a document of the American Lutheran Church, the Articles of Union for the American Lutheran Church. Quote, we deem it advisable that the American Lutheran Church strive for unity in practice, and therefore we recognize the responsibility of the Church to recommend appropriate practices. Now, when the founders of the AFLC looked at a quote like that from the American Lutheran Church, they did not see the congregational autonomy that they valued as being part of the Lutheran Free Church. In the Lutheran Free Church, matters of worship practices while they generally tended to be more on the low church end of the spectrum, were left up to congregational decision. If you wanted to have vestments, or chant, or anything else of the bells and whistles, that was up to your congregation. If you wanted to have very little by way of liturgy, or structure in your worship, but wanted to keep things pretty simple, that was also up to the congregation. Now, arguments might be made for one style over another, and some of those arguments are quite legitimate. But the issue here is not about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of high church or low church worship. The issue here 
is that the American Lutheran Church wanted to strive for, quote, unity in practice, unquote, as a whole church body. And these formerly Lutheran Free Church congregations wanted nothing to do with that. Unity in practice across a broad spectrum of congregations comes from an environment of centralized control. And centralized control is not something that they found in their Lutheran Free Church history, nor is it something that they found in the New Testament. Congregations at that time in the Lutheran Free Church and in the New Testament were free to make those decisions on their own. This issue, once again, has to do with congregationalism. And while the issue of being low church is the presenting issue, just like district presidents were the presenting issue in the point before, the real deeper issue here is congregationalism. These folks wanted to preserve their autonomy, according to the New Testament. The final point here is pietism. And the two main issues here that are brought up under the heading of pietism are social dancing and social drinking. Now I want to read to you what the heading says. And this is on page 276. Now finally, we object to merger with the American Lutheran Church because it does not represent the pietism we believe is needed and right for our day. I'll continue the quote into the first paragraph. Pietism has different meanings to different people, and so we speak of, quote, the pietism that is needed and right for our day, unquote. We think of pietism as an emphasis on personal Christianity, and in which emphasis the Christian does not use all his Christian liberty, both because of his own weakness, which may lead to occasions of the flesh, and because he must watch his example and not cause a weaker brother to fall. Now, the issues that they chose to highlight in 1962 were social drinking and social dancing. And while those might not be the same issues that we would choose to highlight today if we were talking about pietism, nevertheless, the thing to notice here is that pietism, namely personal and living Christianity, was something that was very important to these folks. When a lot of conservative Christians look around today, the two hot-button issues are abortion and homosexuality. Now these were perhaps much less central hot-button issues, but they were the hot-button issues at that time, the social drinking and social dancing. And what was associated with those things in the mind of these folks was worldliness and sin, was a lack of reverence for God, a lack of concern for one's neighbor. And while we might not associate worldliness or lack of concern for one's neighbor with those same things in every instance today, we certainly do want to watch out for anything that lacks concern for God and lacks concern for neighbor. We also today in AFLC, many of us anyway, wish to be pietists, whether we like the name or not. We wish to see living Christianity. We wish to see people living out their faith in Christ, applying God's word to their own lives, demonstrating concern for their neighbor, looking out for their weaker brother around them. Those are concerns that we share with, these, with this emphasis on pietism and on personal Christianity that was present in the Lutheran Free Church and in the beginnings of the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations. We will be talking a lot more in subsequent episodes about what pietism means, what congregationalism means, what the doctrine of scripture means. But these, these five points that are listed here, the World Council of Churches, conservative theology, church polity, high churchliness, and pietism, these points all have to do with the five foundational principles that I've mentioned that we value in the AFLC. Scripture, Christology, justification, piety, and congregationalism. Those are things that we value, that we hold to, and those are the things that we have valued and have held to from the beginning of our association. 
how those ought to be applied in our context? Well, that's a local decision. But we'll be talking about some more of those issues in subsequent episodes. In the meantime, thank you for watching The Dream That Would Not Die, and God bless you.